Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Lori Rose Linton, and it is my honor to welcome you today to the launch of the Alliance for Healthy Lifestyles and Healthy People. I am the CEO of Hip Hop Public Health, which is a unique nonprofit that harnesses the transformative power of music, art, and science to promote health literacy, inspire behavior change, and achieve health equity. And so it's no surprise why we would want to be a part of and, and help support hosting today's convening because Healthy People 2030 is really all about the tenets of achieving health equity, improving health disparities, and, and really eliminating them. And so um, at this time, uh, on behalf of Hip Hop Public Health and our, and our founder, Dr. Elijah Day Williams, I am proud to turn this over in a very unique way to Mr. Jim Whitehead, who's going to be uh, sort of the, the voice of behind the scenes here um, to kick it off. And Jim is not only an esteemed board member of Hip Hop Public Health, he's also the CEO of the International Society of Sports Psychiatry. So Jim, uh, over to you. Great, well, thank you, Lori, and uh, thanks to our speakers and to those in the audience. Um, through the magic of technology, I've decided to join you from the audience <laughs> and, uh, as we try to uh, make everything happen beautifully, but um, um, it, it is great to have you all with us and uh, what we will uh, go through very, very quickly so, um, the, uh, Lori, I think I have some slides. Uh, sure, hang on. Just, so. just and I'll just go through these very, very quickly. And um, so, this is truly about addressing the historic need for a healthier decade, nation, and people. Um, Lori, please next slide. And I, I wanted to share a quote in terms of what we're trying to do together here. Uh, from William Jennings Bryant, um, a great Secretary of State uh, in, in the uh, early 20th century. The destiny is no matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. And it's not a thing to be waited for, it is a thing to be achieved. So uh, let's keep that in mind. This Healthy People 2030 represents in a lot of ways our destiny for the future. But it's not just to be talked about, it's to take action on. And so just real quickly, and you'll hear about this from our uh, first speaker in just a moment, the Healthy People 2030. There are core objectives, and next slide, Lori. And then it's broken down by accessible by all kinds of, uh, of ways, which you'll hear about. And uh, next slide, Lori. And so here's what we're wanting to do with that, uh, to, to create sections uh, and units of organizations with a common interest. To use Healthy People 2030 as objectives as essential targets for our progress together. And then to mobilize for collective action and continuous improvement. And we'll talk about that a bit more at the end. But the whole point about this is that it is very action oriented. So um, what's next, and we'll get at this at the end, but uh, also to preview this, to, to, to really go to the Healthy People, uh, go to Healthy People 2030 and identify objectives of interest to your organization. Um, next slide. Uh, to go to the Alliance website and indicate your interest in areas. So in Healthy People 2030, as you're about to hear, there's all kinds of ways. There are going to be 55 objectives that will be relevant to your organization and so you go there and you go to the Alliance website, what you're interested in, and the Alliance will contact you for an organizational meeting based on Healthy People 2030 and the interest areas. And I think one, one more, yeah, Lori? Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so, yes, please. Jim, why don't we um, introduce who's here today and then we will get started um, with our first presentation. Well, excellent. We have uh, with us today a marvelous um, group of uh, individual leaders and uh, with uh, Carter uh, Blakely, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Um, and she has a wonderful career of public service, uh, is, uh, overseeing the Healthy People uh, 2030 development 
and has had a deep commitment uh, through through that throughout her uh, career. We also are going to have, so that's really the setup. We'll hear from Carter, kind of just the basics, you'll get a feel for it and so forth. And then we're going to look at an area that you may not think is a health platform, but sports and particularly youth sports. And we have uh, Tom Ferry and Jennifer Brown Lerner joining us, with, uh, joining us uh, from uh, Aspen Institute Project Play Initiative. Uh, Tom is the executive director of it, and he has a marvelous career. He's really a pioneering journalist. He has done um, all, all kinds of wonderful things in media. But his focus on the, the, what has become the Sport and Society program is really transformative. It, it's, its mission is to uh, bring together leaders, uh, facilitate the conversation, and translate it into action. Um, and so this program signature initiative is Project Play, which you'll hear about, but it really is the platform of, um, of sports for advancement of health, a, a new kind of approach that we um, uh, that, that uh, for some of us, new approach um, uh, to advancing health. And um, uh, following, uh, we will have Nico Prox, who is a remarkable professional, as all of these are. He's president of the uh, Health Partners Institute and chief science officer at Health Partners. Um, he is also adjunct professor, professor at Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. And he really, and it's relevant to uh, our meeting today, that he's really focused on connecting evidence of effectiveness with the practical applications of programs and practices. Uh, nothing could be more relevant uh, than that to our uh, discussion uh, today. So uh, it, it's a marvelous, integrated uh, group of individuals who uh, are with us and who are sharing their thoughts with you. So let's um, first start with uh, Carter of ODTHP, who has overseen the development of the Healthy People Initiative in uh, Healthy People 2030. Carter, please. Great, great. And um, thank you so much, Jim. And I'm really honored to be here today. Um, you've collected a wonderful group of like-minded organizations at the Alliance for Healthy Lifestyles and Healthy People Launch. And Lori, I do have a slide, I guess. Do you want to put just the title slide up? Right. In case you forgot who I was after Jim just introduced me. Um, so anyway, Jim, thank you for your dedication over the last couple of years. Um, you've stood by us during the development of Healthy People 2030. And in the background, you were rallying together all sorts of people to support us. So thank you. And I also want to recognize um, Nico Pronk, who was our co-chair of the Secretary's Advisory Committee for National Health Prevention and Disease, um, National Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Objectives for 2030. Um, that advisory committee really um, gets a ton of credit for where we are today. They helped guide us through the selection of objectives, developing our framework, um, ensuring that we continue to put the bar really high and strive for eliminating disparities, achieving health equity, and as well as um, focusing on the social determinants of health. So thank you. And then again, thanks, of course, to all of you in the audience um, who share our common goal to improve the health and well-being of the country. So I I hope that some of you are familiar with healthy people and that you um, contributed to the development. If you did submit comments, you can rest assured that we did pay attention to them. So healthy people sets a shared vision for the health of the nation. This decade, our healthy people vision is a society in which all people can achieve their full potential for health and well-being across the lifespan. And healthy, no, we're on the, still on that slide. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, healthy People is one of HHS's longest running and most influential health initiatives. And it was actually the first national framework established by HHS um, back in the late seventies for tracking progress on prevention strategies over time. And since 1980, HHS has set measurable objectives with targets to improve the health and well-being of the nation through the Healthy People Initiative 
And this decade, Healthy People 2030, builds on the previous decade's efforts. Um, so we've taken the lessons we've learned, um, integrated the latest public health challenges um, and priorities that we face today. And we say that healthy people, while it's federally led, it really is stakeholder driven. A healthy people does rely on input from the public through its advisory committee, which is entirely on federal. We have multiple public comment periods um, throughout the development process, which actually takes several years. And then within the federal government, we have um, subject matter experts across every agency at HHS. And we even pull in representatives from other departments, EPA, USDA, Department of Education, um, Transportation. Um, we, we finally realized that we can't improve health just by staying in our own traditional health silo. So next slide, please. Great. So as you can see on this slide, Healthy People 2030 includes three types of objectives. There are the 355 core or measurable objectives that Jim mentioned earlier. And we also have 114 developmental objectives and 40 research objectives. So core objectives were chosen using really rigorous selection criteria and they have reliable nationally representative data and associated evidence-based interventions. Then the other categories, the developmental objectives and research objectives um, lack some of that information. For example, the developmental objectives lack reliable baseline data associated with them. And then research objectives require a stronger evidence base before we can even consider adding them as a core objective. But both those other, the research and the developmental um, objectives reflect high priority, new or emerging, emerging public health issues where we want to encourage additional exploration. And then the, oops, no back, not yet, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then the leading health indicators, you can see that subset in green there for the LHIs as we call them, are a subset of 23 high priority objectives that highlight critical public health issues that affect people in different stages of life. So the LHIs, address um, the leading causes of death and disease in the United States, including heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Um, they emphasize upstream factors, which are the conditions in people's environments and behaviors that influence their health. Then we also feature in Healthy People 2030, eight overall health and well-being measures, or OHMs, that we use throughout the decade to track progress toward our vision um, while the Healthy People objectives focus on, focus on specific issues, the OHMs are their broad um, global outcome measures to evaluate the nation's health status overall. So next slide, please. So promoting health equity is a key part of our mission at ODPHP and HHS, and I think actually today across the entire federal government. Um, but it's, it's central to Healthy People 2030's framework. So that's why Healthy People has an overarching focus on addressing the social determinants of health, eliminating health disparities, and achieving health equity. And then I'd like to point out that our emphasis on the social determinants of health provides ample opportunities to partner with organizations outside the public se sector, like many of the um, you that are represented today. And Healthy People also drives action for other initiatives, um, strengthening our work to improve the health and well being um, within O8, ODPHP. For example, we, um, ODPHP issues the fiscal activity guidelines for Americans, the dietary guidelines for Americans. We have programs focused on health literacy. And Healthy People 2030 includes specific objectives on the fiscal activity guidelines and um, nutrition objectives. And health literacy is kind of embedded in everything we do. And in fact, Healthy People 2030, for the first time since the 2010 decade, um, has a new health literacy definition. The last couple decades, we have had a, an objective, not objective, but a, um, a definition 
that focuses on individual responsibility for being able to access and understand and act on information. This decade, we've, we've added a second definition to complement that, and that's organizational um, health literacy, recognizing that organizations do carry a responsibility to ensure that information they put out is of use um, and of benefit to, to individuals. So while, no, oh well, you, we're fine. That's good to say there. So um, we recognize that we can achieve our healthy people vision at ODPHP on our own, or even if we were to work just within the federal government with our fellow um, government colleagues, but we really do need the help of partners like you. So again, it's a, all the more importance for um, ODPHP and HHS to be a part of the Alliance's launch today. So now next slide, please. So um, there's a lot folks can do to help us implement Healthy People 2030 and achieve our goals and objectives for the decade. So especially as we look ahead at our nation's long-term recovery from COVID-19, um, we need healthy people's shared vision for a healthier nation now more than ever. Um, COVID-19 really did focus our attention so acutely on the danger of health disparities and the importance of improving health for all Americans, regardless of race, sex, ability, socioeconomic status, or even where they live. Had um, the American population um, achieved the healthy people objectives for the last decade, we would not have found ourselves with faced so many um, incidences, populations with really deadly chronic diseases and underlying conditions. So as such, we all should be using healthy people to identify our needs and priority populations related to health disparities and to set targets that address those needs. And specifically, there are a number of ways, of ways that partners and organizations can work toward achieving healthy people's vision. Um, C, for example, CBOs can use healthy people data as a benchmark for measuring progress toward health outcomes and find evidence-based resources um, to inform their public health practices that they may put in place. Policymakers can use healthy people's data and evidence-based objectives to inform development, develop and implement policies that improve um, our nation's health and address health disparities. And academic organizations can use healthy people as a teaching tool um, part of your curriculum. Um, you can use healthy people to support your research agenda that works toward achieving the objectives. And then also partner with other organizations to develop and evaluate, um, provide some science-based evaluation evidence for practices that can help move the nation um, toward better health. And then what's really important are these cross-sector partnerships, which I think the Alliance uh, represents. Um, Working, looking beyond your own specific organization, pulling in other organizations that um, share common goals. They might not be in your same lane, but recognizing that we can all share common goals and visions, even though we might fall out, fall into different sectors. So that's so important to, to realize that connection there. So it's really um, only together that we can drive action in all sectors to prevent disease, promote health, and advance um, health equity nationwide. I mean, we can only do so much at the, the federal level, uh, but we do rely on alliances such as this one to really move the needle forward and show a difference um, in our health moving forward. So anyway, thank you. That I hope that was a, a quick but thorough enough overview of healthy people. And um, we really look forward to working to the alliance in the future. Um, Carter, thank you so much for that very informative presentation. And before we, we let you go backstage for a little while, um, there's a, a couple of questions that have come up. And so we have one here from, from John Metzler. Um, what is the definition of organizational health literacy? Oh gosh, I have I don't have it at the top of my head. It's not a short one. Um, but the gist of it is that instead of 
focusing on the individual. Like with healthy people, each of our objectives has to have a data source. So we have to collect data on each of our objectives. So for an, um, individual health literacy, we needed to collect data that reflected how individuals were able to act on information they received. Organizational health literacy will focus on what organizations are doing to help ensure that individuals have access to health information that they can understand and use. But if you would like the specific um, definition, please go to health.gov slash healthy people 2030 and you will find it there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn this over to the voice of Jim Whitehead to move us forward. And I'm going to unmute you, Jim. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> and I actually enjoy being in the audience. <laughs> it's great. Uh, Carter, just one, one question, then I'll introduce just real quickly. Um, the sections, uh, we're, we're going to uh, have sections that are devoted on a range of health issues. And Kelly, uh, uh, email me just real quickly. If we aren't making the progress that is intended, uh, what uh, as a country? Um, obviously, the, the sections can begin to focus on that because they're going to use Healthy People 2030 as both the target and what is our progress toward that. But do you have any just kind of quick thoughts of how that, that process will go uh, within the federal government and then how the private sector should respond? Well, within the, um, the federal government, the way we carry out Healthy People throughout the decade, we're, we're constantly monitoring our progress toward achieving those objectives. We work really closely with the National Center of Health Statistics. They're kind of, they're our data gurus and help ensure that the data and um, that we've put on our website and we use to measure our objectives truly is nationally represented and, and valid, has large enough um, sample sizes that you can consider it to be reliable. So we'll be reporting on progress throughout the decade on our objectives. So if we were to see um, progress not uh, moving along at a pace that would ensure that we could meet or even improve in our objectives, that will help not only the, at us at the federal level, but also folks in the communities who are also tracking objectives, see where they need to focus more resources. And um, another approach to that is to look at our progress for an objective. You'll look at the national progress, but each of our objectives, population-based objectives, does have that population data. So you can look at the data for the objectives by different, different demographic groupings, whether it's race, ethnicity, geographic location, sex, age, you know, insurance status. Um, and you can see if within an objective, if there's a particular population that's not doing well, and that's a signal that more resources and attention needs to go to that particular population. And that's um, the one thing we've learned from the pandemic is that there are populations who did not do well and they're still not doing well, but um, we had population level data that could show that. Great, excellent. Thank, thank you, Carter. Uh, you are the epitome of a public servant in the best sense of that. And we appreciate everything that you do and look forward to the private sector and NGOs collaborating closely with you and as we organize our work in sections. Thank you, thank you very much. Right, and thank you. Um, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to, um, as I did briefly earlier, introduce um, uh, Carl Lung, uh, Tom Ferry and Jennifer uh, Brown Lerner. Uh, I have uh, collaborated with Tom for a very long time and have seen Project Play as part of Aspen Institute really achieve extraordinary things. And, you know, again, for, for many, it's a sector that's not necessarily thought as a platform for health advancement. But as you'll hear, hear from uh, Tom and Jennifer, it's not only a platform, it's a powerful platform. So Tom and Jennifer, please. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you, Jim, for, uh, for inviting us to be part of this. And, and great to see some of the names uh, in, the, in the chat, which we're familiar with. So I'm going to try and not be redundant here. 
um, let you kind of know how Project Play and the Aspen Institute's Project Play, our larger initiative, kind of fit into Healthy People 30, 2030 and, and hopefully make a contribution uh, to building healthier communities um, through sports. So maybe we can, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's really got the best information to share here, but I'm going to whip through several slides and then go to her. All right, so first of all, Project Play is something we started in 2013. Jim was on the, you know, the original uh, advisory board that built out, uh, you know, um, the framework that we have used to help mobilize um, the various sectors that, uh, that, that touch the lives of children. I'll run through that in a minute, which is those eight different sectors. Um, so yeah, it's basically uh, an initiative to uh, uh, develop and, and share knowledge and apply knowledge on how to build healthy communities through sports. Because in this country, there is no um, sports ministry or equivalent like there is in pretty much every other country in the world to coordinate activity in, in the sports sector. So we felt like we could be that, that convener, that facilitator of dialogue uh, to really drive solutions. So next slide, please. It's all based upon, um, the argument is based upon uh, the research you see aggregated into this simple infographic, which uh, ACSM uh, and other entities came together to uh, produce, um, boy, almost, almost a decade ago, really, uh, which helps you understand uh, you know, uh, that, that physically active kids simply do better in life, right? They're one-tenth as likely to be obese, they're more likely to stay in school, uh, lower pregnancy rates for girls, um, more likely to go on to college, um, they have lower health care costs, they have lower incidence of uh, a range of chronic, um, chronic diseases, including 13 types of cancer. They're more likely to be active parents, and because they're more likely to be active parents, they're good role models for their kids because look at them and say, oh, that's just how you live your life. Um, and so they become active themselves. Um, this is just, again, aggregating the stacks and stacks of research uh, to make the case for why it's important to get kids off the couch without running in, them into the ground at an early age. And we just know that's not always happening in, um, in our communities. Um, our data show that you know, uh, you know, most kids do not get a, a quality sustained experience into the teenage years. We just structurally push kids aside at a very early age because they're not seen to be the best athletes or they're just not from the upper income homes that can afford to start writing those $2,000 checks to clubs, uh, you know, that are going to give them an opportunity to, you know, get real playing time for their high school team or maybe even have a chance to compete in college. So, they just check out early. So we have some real dysfunction in our sports system um, and we're doing our best to try and uh, try and help folks fix it. So next slide, please. Um, so if, if the prior slide is really about the impact on, on the individual, what we've done, and this is, this is produced just last year uh, by a member of our team, uh, taking the research um, and, and looking at what, you know, physically active communities, those that invest in uh, getting people out, playing sports, walking, biking, all of that. How do they do? And they simply do better. They, you know, again, lower uh, rates of smoking, um, you know, people, people bike more, higher property values. We know that, you know, uh, homes near parks, for instance, uh, uh, sell for more. Um, higher graduation rates. So there's a real argument for municipal leaders and state and federal leaders to invest in building uh, active communities. Um, this is the argument that you see right here. Um, next slide, please. So how to do this exactly? So what we've done with this uh, playbook over my shoulder here, which uh, Jim sat on the advisory group for, uh, was was develop um, a concept of sport for all, play for life, a playbook to get every kid in the game. Released in 2015 at the Project Play Summit, where uh, Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy gave the keynote and really offered the first comments by that office on the value of youth sports in building a healthy community. So, um, you know, his message was 
this is great. Uh, now let's take it into communities. So what this thing consists of are eight strategies for the eight sectors that touch the lives of kids. Those eight strategies or plays as we call them, and I'll try not to go on too much about them. Um, but, you know, the first one is asking kids what they want, simply, you know, building the voice of children into the design of experiences, because we know youth sports are organized youth sports are really designed by adults for adults. So how do we create those feedback loops to uh, optimize experiences and make them stickier, uh, make them experiences that kids are going to uh, uh, want to sign up for again? Uh, the next one is just reintroducing free play. We've seen the shift over the past generation or two uh, toward organized play, which is great, uh, but it in, in many cases has crowded out free play, pick a play, ride bikes around the neighborhood, family play, the type of stuff that uh, really delivers um, you know intrinsic uh, intrinsic benefits um, that can keep people active for for life. Right. The third one is encourage sports sampling which is really a two-part call to action. One is a pushback on this trend toward early sports specialization where, you know, kids in grade school are asked to focus on one sport or another because that's their opportunity to uh, get a college scholarship or maybe even just get playing time uh, uh, for that, that high school team, uh, you know, uh, where 120 kids try out and not that many make it. And it just gets very competitive very early. Uh, and the second piece of that is just, introducing kids to a wider variety of sport experiences than they're typically introduced to. Uh, about 120 different sports out there. How can we through, you know, uh, PE, through uh, pediatricians, through uh, other mechanisms, through working with national governing bodies, uh, connect kids to uh, a, a, a greater diversity of sport experiences. The fourth is revitalizing in-town leagues. And what we mean by that is local leagues that are easy to get to, classmates playing with classmates at low cost. A real key piece in bringing back community-based play is improving the quality of the experience itself. Training the coaches, um, which is another one of our call to actions and the key competencies in working with youth, including sports skills and tactics. So parents don't feel like they have to flee to the travel team starting in second and third grade just to preserve an opportunity for the kid to play later on. The next one is think small, which is simply, it simply means being creative with the play spaces in your community. So shared use agreements, um, building smaller spaces. You don't always need a, an 11 v 11 soccer field. You can build a, a little soccer space in an urban community and a neighborhood for a lot less than that hundred, you know, $150,000. Uh, and you can, you know, uh, do a lot of great things that we don't think, we have to always build these massive uh, sport complexes. Uh, the next one is design for development, which is really just a, uh, a call to anchor our sports system in the principles of age appropriate play. You know, uh, you know, uh, elementary school teachers know that you can't teach calculus to a kid in third grade. You have to progressively get there. Um, we have a landscape of well-meaning coaches and program leaders who are often coaching six and seven and eight year olds like they're in high school and they just don't know how the brain is developing what kids can handle what they you know what they should be introduced to at an early age so how do we work with the sport organizations to get them trained up in that which feeds into the ne uh, next strategy train all coaches i sort of covered that a minute ago uh, just the minimum ask is you know coaching philosophy for kids basics and physical literacy and sports skills and safety. And the final one is ethicized prevention, which is a recognition that there are a lot of parents now, uh, uh, according to you know our studies, who are concerned about if I introduce my kid to sport, are they really going to receive positive health outcomes? They, they hear about the concussions, they hear about the ACL injuries, they see some of the uh, you know emotional abuse that's out there, and and they're 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 less likely to introduce their kids to a sport experience. So we've got to take that piece of it seriously. So those are the eight strategies that we ask all of the stakeholders who come into Project Play to think about activating against. Uh, next slide, please. Is uh, here are the eight key sectors. So we understand that, you know, community recreation groups cannot solve this alone. YMCA's cannot do this alone. Boys and Girls Clubs can't do it alone. Park and Recs can't do it alone nor can that entire sector. So it is, you know, uh, 
you, you, you really need all of the different sectors and you see that I'm not going to read them all for you, but they all need to be bought into this idea of building a, a healthier America through sports. Um, and so we ask each one of them to say, okay, what can you do? What tools can you develop? What knowledge can you share? How can you be part of uh, the collective impact effort that is, uh, that is project play? So next slide. And I think this is where I turn over to Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. Go Jennifer. So, um, with our framework, and as you can see, we've tried to lay out how we think that youth sports are a critical element of creating healthy people, but also healthy communities. Um, we have a tool that can help you um, think about this in the context of your own community. Um, our tool is called Teamwork Toolkit. Um, it's free. Everything available is open source. Um, you're the one that's got to bring the information and the data and customize it to your own community. Um, so the website is um, here on the on um, on the slide, uh, teamworktoolkit.projectplay.us. Um, and if you head to the next slide, please, um, the tool work consists of um, six user friendly modules that walk you through uh, different exercises, which will help uh, define your focus and ambition, help you think about the individuals within your communities that represent the eight sectors and what they have to offer. Think about ways for you to incorporate youth voice, help you understand how you can gauge what you have in terms of resources, both programs, facilities, and other capacities of individuals within your community, and bring them all together to think about what's next and build a roadmap. Within each module, you walk out with a, a piece of data that can be helpful for your community both to bring people together to think about building quality youth sport experience, but also increasing access across your community to quality youth sport experience. So if you flip to the next slide, you will see our website as well as my email. Um, encourage you to reach out. Uh, we stand ready to help uh, the Alliance uh, and think about the ways in which youth sports can be a critical partner in building healthy communities. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Tom. This is incredibly informative. And um, Jim, would you like to uh, come on to to, to uh, say anything else right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank thanks to Tom and Jennifer for your always outstanding job that you do. And uh, speaking from the audience, I can tell you we're, we're really impressed with all the presentations. But, but the, the, the thing about Project Play is it's practical, sophisticated, innovative, and it works. It's really focused on numbers and so forth, and we really appreciate it. But, but here would be one, one question. We're talking about Healthy People 2030, uh, where we want to be at the end of the decade. Uh, Tom, Jennifer, how would you describe that in regard to your hopes for Project Play and youth sports in this country by 2030? Yeah, so I would say that, uh, and we have this all kind of mapped out in our own theory of change here, is that um, um, we would like to have um, a sports system in this country that uh, where, where more kids are playing um, than we're currently playing right now. It's a little bit challenging coming out of COVID where exactly what's going to be the new normal. But that, that there are system supports for getting and keeping kids active through sports. So what are the policies uh, that guide access to sport? What are the tools that get coaches and program leaders uh, trained in, in key principles? What are the mandates and incentives uh, to make sure that the quality of the experience uh, is, is there? Um, and then how mindful have we been and what mechanisms are in place to really drive access and, and equity, right? So we need to be extremely mindful of the, of the underrepresented populations in sport right now, uh, and design, uh, you know, specific solutions to uh, to help close those close those gaps, but also lift uh, the whole the whole space. It's sort of a an act of uh, what they call you know uni uh, targeted universalism, really being very mindful of those who are, are, are behind, but also just trying to improve the system in general. So I think there are a lot of interesting policy conversations that are occurring this year. We have the National Youth Sports Strategy in place. We just have a nice uh, uh, you know, declaration of support for youth sports um, 
and its role in building healthy children and communities from President Biden. Um, I, you know, we have the Healthy uh, Healthy People 2030 uh, piece in place from a public health standpoint. So, you know, I'm relatively optimistic that we're going to have a good story to tell by 2030 collectively. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work um, and and people focused on making sure that health is part of the sport conversation in this country and sport is part of the health conversation. Or health, sports, sport, health. You got my idea. <laughs> thank, thank you, Tom. Excellent. Um, I, I know colleagues are really appreciating the way that you're focused on um, uh, ensuring that uh, health and prevention is an important part of the youth sports experience. And, and um, Jennifer, just real quickly before we turn to Tom, is there anything you would want to say about the teamwork toolkit, which we've had great conversations about and think it's powerful and look forward to working with you on that? But how could that might align if something kind of immediate comes to mind, how the teamwork toolkit could align with Healthy People 2030 aims? Yeah, well, I think there's two ways, you know, that come to mind, you know, at first. I mean, a big part of what um, uh, Healthy People 2030 has done is set out, um, you know, very specific goals um, around w what this looks like. I think that the teamwork toolkit can help you set uh, or customize those goals or some of those metrics for your community. Um, in addition, as Tom mentioned, I think the teamwork toolkit gives you a common language across all of the sectors that we mentioned, across health, across sport, across education, uh, across business and philanthropy, to begin to talk about the value of youth sports in creating healthy communities. And so with that, it can be really valuable for the customization to the context of your own community as we think about this in the context of our country as well. Very excellent. Well, again, thank thank you both so uh, very, very much. And uh, we're now going to have the pleasure of <laughs> such excellence, uh, followed by excellence, of hearing from Nico Pronk, who uh, has played remarkable roles. But the thing that I should say, in, in particular, that he uh, served as the HHS secretary uh, co-chair for the advisory committee. Uh, that that uh, made recommendations on the whole design of Healthy People 2030. And that what is also great about Nico, he can look at the science, but as said earlier, he really is focused on how do you translate that into action and progress. So Nico, uh, we're glad to have you with us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And, and thank you everybody else on the, on the call today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. And uh, just thinking back about the experience of being on the uh, committee, I would just like to say thank you to all the ODPHP staff and uh, and uh, the, just the staff in general on the federal side. Uh, enormous amount of work and a heavy lift. But there are two people in particular, and you've already met Carter Blakey and then uh, Emmeline Ocha as well. Uh, just phenomenal support from those uh, from those staff in the in ODA, ODPHP. So with that, um, I'd like to just make a couple of comments and keep it fairly short. But if you go to the next slide, um, I was very, you know, proud and and privileged and and felt very honored to have co-chaired the advisory committee for Healthy People 2030. It was an absolutely phenomenal group of people to work with. Uh, and we were quite productive uh, going to the next slide. Um, we had a, 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 a charge that was uh, quite uh, challenging to uh, reduce the uh, number of objectives by more than half, um, you know, for the, for the new decade, um, which came with uh, some, some, uh, some, I would say, challenges in the sense that we really needed to make sure that there was an, uh, a key rationale for making those cuts. And so we we were quite productive, I think, in uh, coming up with reports that laid out a strategy to get there. Um, quite a few reports were submitted. They were all accepted by the secretary. Um, but as part of those reports, we, we also included the implementation of Healthy People 2030. And of course, that's really the, the, the topic of today's presentations. It is uh, how to identify the actions that need to happen in order to, by the end of the decade, actually achieve the goals that are being set. So going to the next uh, slide, 
um, there is very little I can say about Healthy People 2030 without mentioning the framework. I think uh, this was our first effort, uh, the first, you know, really the, the first energy that was implemented um, uh, and, and directed towards uh, organizing our thinking of Healthy People 2030. And the framework, I think, has proven to be an anchor for all of the work that was, uh, that was going on. Um, it is organized around the idea that we want uh, health and well-being across the lifespan. It addresses environments, physical, social, and economic. It addresses health disparities, health equity, and health literacy. And it brings together all sorts of needed resources, stakeholders, and actions uh, to make the work happen. So uh, all of this, uh, I, I think the framework is really a, a great, great way to think about what we need to achieve and how to go about it. Um, recognizing also that you cannot do this without tr strategic resources. And, uh, and that really gets to not just the federal side of things to keep, keep things moving at the level of the nation, but all the way down to the local level and what organizations can uh, can can support uh, on their own as well. So the other introduction, uh, which is the next slide, of uh, worthy of mentioning is the introduction of health and well-being as a single theme. So we we've always thought around health, uh, being physical and mental health uh, in particular. But well-being is a much more broadly uh, defined uh, area of focus. What Healthy People 2030 did is actually pull these two terms together and, and treat them as a single one. And we defined it by, by basically saying how people think, feel, and function at a personal and social level and how they evaluate their lives as a whole. And I think uh, up to this point, at least, this has been uh, this has proven to be an, uh, an, an, uh, a very robust and inclusive kind of definition uh, that can be applied to uh, to many levels across society and across many different organizations and institutions. Uh, certainly, uh, as we talk here a little bit later about the, the business and industry sector, how people think, feel, and function very quickly translates into productivity at the workplace, but it's also productivity in, in people's lives. So it, it really does go uh, beyond uh, organizational boundaries as well. And it's novel in the fact that it does make Healthy People 2030 think in a different way. It thinks about goals and objectives in terms of uh, uh, assets. Uh, how can we pursue positive health and well-being uh, improvements in health and well-being, rather than thinking about reducing risks to health uh, by by addressing illness or preventing disease, so it, it changes the uh, the the paradigm a bit, and uh, I think this was an important introduction uh, to the to the initiative. So, what do what do we use Healthy People 2030 for? The next slide starts to outline some suggested areas of focus. Uh, certainly, it can be a national agenda, even though it's also uh, uh, used across uh, the globe in other countries. Um, it is a science-based, uh, measurable objectives with targets that can be achieved by the end of the decade. So uh, it can really help support uh, the idea of uh, setting goals uh, with, with targets. It's data-driven. Uh, it can certainly support program planning and then, of course, important benchmarks for health and well-being efforts uh, for organizations, institutions and, and, and communities uh, across, the, or, across the country. So this sort of brings us then to um, the alliance, the proposed alliance. And on the next slide, um, I'm basically outlining here uh, some some pretty clear and, and simple um, arguments for uh, the, the benefits that an alliance will bring. It's an alignment of action that, that allows to benefit everybody who participates. Uh, an alliance can bring alignment across multiple levels uh, that provides leverage and reinforcement. So how do individuals link to their family, link to their workplace, link to their, their community, link, and how does that community link to the the county and the uh, state level, 
all the way up to the federal level. Um, all the, you know, these levels need to leverage each other and we need to find ways to uh, use as, as little energy as possible to get as much yield as possible. That alignment also extends across multiple levels uh, uh, for scalability and sustainability. So as we start working on implementation of programs, in particular those that we have evidence of effectiveness, how can we make sure that we scale them up so that it can be implemented equitably and that we can be sustained for long enough to really get the benefit? And finally, alliances, because you work together and you work with organizations and people that think differently, that come out of different perspectives, it can really drive innovation, differentiation and success for people as well as organizations. So a shared level of success will be very important as well. And then to, to follow along on the next slide, an alliance should also be focused on engagement and implementation. We need to make sure that stakeholders are engaged as a critical component for implementation, that they, they, uh, they together generate a level of collective action that benefits uh, many across society. And you know, at the end of the day, all, everybody, uh, this work is ongoing, obviously. It's going to be developing and it will progress over the course of the coming decade. And having an alliance will also provide a very useful approach to uh, allow convening to take place. We need to find places and spaces where we can come together and connect. An alliance can be, can be doing that uh, very nicely. So as Jim um, invited me to think about uh, the work site in particular, um, we've been able to bring several companies together in very short order to at least make, an, uh, make a commitment to, uh, to start meeting on this topic. And so several organizations have already committed to do so as part of a section on work site safety, health and well-being. Uh, early commitments come from different health systems, including the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Health Partners in Minneapolis. Uh, some global organizations, Aon, Risk and Reinsurance, as well as SPURTEC, as well as organizations or associations, I should say, that bring together a focus on health and business and industry, including the Health Enhancement Research Organization, or HERO, and the International Association for Works at Health Promotion. But there are quite a few others on the list uh, that has already been uh, growing as we speak. So we really look forward to uh, starting off this section in short order. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand back off to, uh, to Laurie and Jim. And thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you so much, Nico. That was incredibly informative. And we'll have Jim join us once again. And I think I, there, are, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I do want to highlight, but I'm going to bring up all of the presenters um, back again, just for some final comments and questions before Jim closes everything down. Um, so we have one question from Russ Carson. Um, why health and wealth, well-being versus health and wellness? And I, I believe this is for Nico. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. And I think the answer really lies in, uh, in, in definitions. Um, the idea of well-being and having multiple uh, domains within well-being and it being defined in, in ways that go way beyond, uh, beyond the individual's health from a physical and, 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 and mental perspective, but really in, in the context of upstream determinants of health. So, um, uh, the idea that we can do something about the environments that in which people find themselves, whether that's the physical environment, the social environment, or the economic environment. And so the well-being uh, approach really lays that out very nicely um, uh, and then connecting that very explicitly with health, that's how we ended up with well-being. Thank you so much, Nico. Um, and I think this final question, and, and Jim, if you want to chime in, this this is really for for all the presenters. Um, implementation can seem overwhelming. Are there any successful examples from Healthy People 2020 that can help us move forward um, as an alliance? Who'd like to jump in first? Well, I can start quickly. Um, 
So we have um, a lot of examples of different approaches. For example, if you're looking at state or local approaches, um, healthy people, even with its 355 objectives, not to mention the 1,200 that were in Healthy People 2020, can seem overwhelming. So what different um, users would do, they'd look at the whole you know, menu of options and they would identify specific objectives that were important to them, just relevant. So, you know, narrowing the focus so you don't feel overwhelmed. And then taking those objectives and trying to find um, comparable data. We have the national level data, um, but working with your communities, um, whatever level you're at, and finding what we call proxy data that you could use to align with the Healthy People National Objective. So, in other words, you'd be using the national objectives as benchmarks to see how you were doing at the local level. Um, and then taking that what information that you find and looking at your own programs and policies. Are there things you need to change or develop that would facilitate achievement in whatever you happen to be focusing on? But then again, if you go to the Healthy People website, we do have what we call the stories from the field and um, evidence-based resources that provide examples. Wonderful. Um, Jim, I think it's time to turn it back over to you to do a final thank you and and wrap up. Yeah. Um, um, but, but if I can just indulge for a second, since I have the keys to this uh, presentation, for those that do not know Mr. Dr. Jim Whitehead, oops, there he is in the background. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, let's see if you can. Nope. We'll we'll, we'll get him there. Um, yeah. At any rate, we want to do a. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> that is interesting, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you for doing something on the fly. But we'll, no, we'll show no, your no, picture no, properly no. before we. It's uh, the it's yeah. the effort. Thank you. Um, I just want to share with our, our presenters that, that there, since I'm in the audience, there literally is a standing ovation occurring right now for all of you. You were just remarkable and did dramatic things. And um, I think that uh, the, and we'll get information out to those who um, are interested in this. And let's say all of you are and others that will be getting this out on demand and so forth. It's, it's very simple. We're going to be inviting you to, you know, come go to the website, to let us know. We'll be reaching out to you. Do you want to be involved with the section? And what is that section? Because I've been getting some, some private questions about, can, can, we do, can we do something in oral health? Can we do something in health literacy? Uh, the answer to all of that is yes. Uh, and I think uh, Carter expressed it well, and, and as did Nico. The numbers were too large to have kind of a, a, a coherent approach uh, with, the, with the previous objectives. I mean, how are you going to do that? So it really has been curated down to 350, which is still a lot. But if we had multiple sections working on this, really engaging the private sector um, uh, with, with these national health objectives, we can make deliberate progress and we'll be open to all of those sections. We just want to make sure that they are uh, you know, large enough uh, to be meaningful. And so I think that, uh, you know, in addressing this, uh, go to do become familiar with Healthy People 2030. It is a remarkable platform of information. If you go to it, you'll see an objective that you'll be interested in, and then it has backup research and other kinds of things. It's a remarkable leap forward uh, for just the accessibility uh, of the national health ob objectives. Um, and, this, and the second thing, once you've kind of identified that, but even if you do just have a, a, an interest uh, in being involved in healthy people, being involved in it collectively and so forth, let us know. And then uh, as indicated here, you know, go, go to the Alliance website, uh, in, indicate your interest areas, and um, we will be reaching out to all those who registered and who will be doing so in the future who get this. And so that's another point. We just need to know what you're interested in, what you want to really help drive progress on. And then I think there's a, one last uh, thing here on this slide. Um, the Alliance will contact you, but it's far better for you to contact after you have contacted us to let us know uh, that we'll be looking at, at setting up an organizational meeting based on you know, what interest area that you would, would like to be involved with. And we'll let you kind of 
um, uh, work to identify partners in that aligned organizations, and we'll try to do that also. And and we've really looked at you know possibilities of of actually you know this is a, a bottom up kind of an initiative, not 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 top down, but bottom up is great. But we will be looking at things you know like maybe technical support or having you know speakers or that sort of thing. So we're interested in people, you know, aligning into these sections, and this is modeled on um, a uh, modeled on um, lots of organizations that use sections, like the World Psychiatric Association does that very well. And so we'll be doing it. So the point being, you've enjoyed a lot of information, but it really is all about action, and we look forward to collaborating with you to make that happen. So I want to thank again all the speakers and um, also all in the audience and all that will be in future audiences, we take this on demand. So thank you all and best wishes. And guess what? It is gonna be a terrific decade. Thanks to all of you. So we'll close with that again. Thanks everyone. We look forward to next steps. Bye-bye.